the will to win isn't always enough. As Sheffield Wednesday discovered on that fateful day against Forest, it can so easily turn to despair. Fighting for their first division lives, the nightmare was becoming reality. Desperation was etched on the faces of the players, the manager and the fans. Deserted by good fortune, even the law of averages, that will to win was being put to the sternest test. They were losing 3-0. Luton Town, their rivals in this final day relegation dogfight, were winning 3-2 away at Derby County. It was a painful end to a season that had promised so much. For many inside Hillsborough that day, the agony of defeat and relegation was too much to bear. For Ron Atkinson, a bitter blow. But even in this darkest hour, there were definite signs that his will to win had not been extinguished. In a nutshell, the worst I've ever felt in the game. Um, because it came, I've got to be honest, it came as a, as a complete shock. I think it did to everybody. I think that's what made it worse. Um, we felt that we'd, we'd turned the corner. I mean, at the start of the year, we were, I said, I've gone on record as saying, we weren't even good enough to be bottom. But after a while, into November and December, we started to produce some of the best football in the first division. Um, and a lot of people were kind enough to say that. And we put results with that. Now, why we went down, why we had that spell at the end of the season, heaven only knows, because our form rate didn't dip. I mean, that would have been, in a, it may have been to our advantage if it had have done. And then we'd have just said, all right, we've got to play scramble football now. But I never felt we had to. I felt we were playing well enough that we'd, we would automatically get enough good results. And to be fair, our points total any other year would have kept us up easily. Luton had pulled off the great escape. Wednesday, with the same 43 points from 38 games, were on their way down to Division 2, with a place in the record books, no consolation. In the last few months, we'd worked hard. We knew that it was a borderline case. We thought we'd, we were going to get out by playing well and doing all the things right. We did it right. We'll go down in history because no one's ever been relegated with that number of points. Before Hillsborough really had time to come to terms with its new status, the Swindon scandal provided a glimmer of hope for First Division survival. With Swindon denied promotion after winning the playoff final, the Owls clung to the lifeline and presented a powerful case for taking their place. It was not to be. Hopes had been raised only to be cruelly dashed. Having decided not to promote Swindon, I would have felt that the logical conclusion would have been to keep ourselves in, or at the worst, promote Newcastle, who were third in the first division. Um, it was beyond me at the time how a team that had finished sixth in the division and hadn't even won the playoffs could still uh, be deemed good enough to go up. In effect, they finished nine places below us. It was a confusing, unsettling time, but that's history. From the start of pre-season training, all thoughts and energies have been focused on the goal of getting back into Division 1, where Sheffield Wednesday belongs. From day one, the commitment that Roger Spry demands has been there. The determination needed to climb straight back into the top flight shines through even the most gruelling of sessions. Who's got a fire? Go, 
Cash! Even the bookies, who don't make many mistakes, Cash! pick the Owls as their favourites to lift the second division championship. As the man responsible for the players' physical fitness, Roger Spry asks for and is getting wholehearted cooperation from the entire squad. Coaching and team tactics are the boss's province and one of his pleasures. Big Ron, amazingly delicate at times, has a global reputation as a shrewd tactician and motivator of men. It shows, even on the practice part. And Ron Atkinson's a manager who's also shrewd enough to appreciate that he needs a right-hand man. Richie Barker's role is very important. Assistant manager at this club means being assistant to Ron. Uh, I mean, Ron is a very busy man, and it's a matter really of someone here uh, tying up the loose ends most of the time on the managerial side, uh, i.e. with the football. Uh, Graham McCrell obviously does the secretarial side on that side, and my job is to, is to liaise with Ron and then to keep that side together uh, when he's not here. Uh, I mean, he's, he's a busy man, he's involved, uh, as you know, in various things, and um, it's the calls on his time, both personal uh, and for the team, are, are, are excessive. And really the job is for me to liaise between the players and the club on that side and keep the playing side together. Together in the dugout, they present a formidable pair. A partnership with equal voice, it would seem. There was certainly a lot to shout about in the first home fixture of the season against Hull City. Wednesday's will to win was there for all to see. So were the five goals they scored that afternoon. The goals came from Wednesday's man in the number nine shirt, David Hurst. Remarkably, the last time a Sheffield Wednesday player hit four goals in a league match was in 1952, and it was against Hull. That player, Derek Dooley. And that was the year the club went on to win the second division title and promotion. A wonderful omen at the start of the campaign where the aim is to make sure that history does repeat itself. It wasn't just the scoreline 5-1 that impressed Ron Atkinson, but the manner of the victory, the style of the football. I've always maintained that I like, to, I like um, my teams to play the way I like to watch a game played. Now, I don't mean by that playing becoming amusement arcades. I don't want us to turn into, uh, oh, they're good to play against because they play well and you beat them. Don't want that, I want us to be winners. Sheffield Wednesday are winners, almost by tradition. The trophy cabinets at Hillsborough are a shining testament to that. But it's 60 years since the truly halcyon days, when the Owls were the force in the game. League champions in 1929, 
they not only retained their title the following season, but reached the FA Cup semi-final for good measure. Today's chairman, though, is looking to the future. We've set ourselves the task of winning the championship and going back into the first division. <laughs> the ingredients is right, because we're playing football like we've never played. Um, all the players, we've much more depth to the side now. We've got a greater depth. We, we've got situations now where everyone on the bench wants to play. <laughs> Not just those on the bench, the reserve team is putting together a tremendous record of results. Their blend of emergent young talent with experienced campaigners means they're not only providing crucial cover for the inevitable injury problems for the first team, but they're constantly challenging for places on merit and talent. When you've got men like Steve McCall lining up in the reserves, it's unlikely that any complacency will creep into the game of any first-team defender. Even so, the opponents in this second-team fixture are sure to provide a tough test. Manchester United are fielding a couple of players who'd strike fear into the heart of any defence, Danny Wallace and Paul Ince. In spite of the multi-million pound men from Old Trafford, it was Wednesday who took the honours and the points. The goal scorer, Steve Whitten, who's been sharpening up on loan in Sweden during the summer months. We've got players now in the reserves that are knocking on the door uh, for places. I mean, for the first time since I've been here, I'm actually spoilt for choice who to pick. The expert whose skills keep the boss spoilt for choice is club physiotherapist Alan Smith. Alan's been with Wednesday since 1983 and is widely recognised as one of the game's top physios. It's a good job he is. Are there special soccer injuries, regular problem areas that he has to treat? Yes, there are a number of common injuries in, in professional football, as you'll appreciate. The most common to the ankle joint is a sprain of a ligament on the outside here and that ligament is injured by what is termed an inversion mechanism that's the foot being twisted into that position there the next area is the mid area of the calf here this is called the musculotendinous junction here between two major muscles in the calf and that again can be injured through overuse, through sprinting, through jumping repeatedly. The Achilles tendon here is an area that uh, does cause quite considerable problems. It's not that commonly injured, but when it is injured, it does create quite, quite a number of problems. David Hurst has just recovered from an injury to his Achilles tendon, and it's taken a couple of weeks for David to, to get over this problem. To the knee, the most common injuries that are sustained to the knee joint are torn cartilages, and ligament sprains. Kevin has a scar here, quite a noticeable scar here, that was produced through a direct blow. A stud actually uh, pierced the skin here and created quite a nasty, a nasty wound. To the thigh, if you take the thigh, Kevin, this muscle in the centre of the thigh here is called the rectus femoris. That muscle is most commonly injured through overuse, through repeatedly kicking, through, through sprinting repeatedly. Um, the area to the outside of the thigh is more susceptible to direct knocks. And there are plenty of those every match. But the game like the show must go on. Football at this level is big business, day in, day out. And like all successful business ventures, progressive investment for the future is essential. Sound finance and on-field success are interwoven. Do the supporters take any interest in the business side of the club's affairs? Do they appreciate where all the gate money goes? 
I think an element do. I think an element aren't particularly interested. I think an element obviously are there to watch the football and in, to be excited and hopefully we give them what they, what they come to, to watch. But there are obviously a number of people, particularly our shareholders who are also supporters, they can see that over the last four years the payroll, particularly in relation to the playing side, has gone up by 100%. And that's if we're going to succeed and compete at the highest level, then we've got to actually pay the players the rate for the job. There's been talk in the past that maybe um, maybe they've been a little bit backward in terms of uh, the, away, the amount of money they would pay at in terms of uh, bonuses and wages to players. Um, I think that's been I think that's been to somewhat resolved. I mean, we look after the players. The players get paid very well here if they produce. I mean, that's the key word. If they produce, there's uh, you know they can be as well off here as anywhere in the country. They are producing, so presumably they're earning good money. There's no disputing, they earn it. It's a hard life, and it can be a short one. Here are the main men on the Wednesday payroll. Nigel Pearson, club captain for the past two seasons. He's 27, was born in Nottingham, and made over 180 appearances for Shrewsbury Town, before joining Wednesday for £250,000 in October 87. A stalwart in defence. Paul Williams joined the Owls from Charlton at the start of this season for £600,000. He joined them from non-league Woodford Town and was an instant success, leading scorer in consecutive seasons. His new club are hoping for more of the same from this 25-year-old Londoner. Northern Ireland international Danny Wilson is the other big summer signing. He came from Luton Town for £200,000. An inspirational midfield player, he began his league career in 77 and has made more than 550 league and cup appearances for Bury, Chesterfield, Nottingham Forest, Brighton and Luton. Swedish international defender Roland Nilsson joined Wednesday in December 89 from Gothenburg for £375,000. He was an immediate success with his new teammates and the supporters, a real character who oozes class. Roland's 27 and was a member of Sweden's World Cup side. Carlton Palmer began his career with West Brom. This 25-year-old midfielder joined Wednesday for a club record fee of £750,000 in February 89. He has four England under-21 caps and last season played for the England B team. David Hurst is a Yorkshireman through and through. Born in Barnsley, he scored nine goals in 29 appearances for his hometown club before joining Wednesday for £200,000 in 86. He's won seven England under-21 caps, and on a charge, this tyke's an awesome sight. For 20 years, Trevor Francis has been thrilling crowds all over the world. Nottingham Forest and Manchester City both paid a million pounds for his services, Wednesday got him on a free transfer in January 1990. Capped 52 times for England, he's without doubt one of the outstanding players of his generation. Defender Steve McCall joined the squad in June 87 after 250 league games for Ipswich Town. A broken leg in only his fifth appearance for Wednesday and serious cartilage injuries have meant a long, hard struggle for fitness, but his patience, courage and dedication means he's back and challenging. Sheffield-born Peter Shirtliff signed schoolboy forms with Wednesday when he was 14. That's 15 years ago. After eight years and 223 games, he joined Charlton, but returned home to Hillsborough for a half million pound fee in the summer of 1989. Steve Whitten, ex-Coventry, West Ham and Birmingham striker, cost the Owls £275,000 in March 89. This 30-year-old didn't get many senior outings last season, but he scored four in the record 8-0 thrashing of Aldershot in the League Cup. Goalkeeper Chris Turner signed as an apprentice in 75 and made 115 League and Cup appearances for Wednesday before he was 21. 
He was with Sunderland for six years before being transferred to Old Trafford. Chris rejoined the Owls in September 88 for £175,000. Kevin Pressman too has come through the ranks at Hillsborough after signing schoolboy forms as a 14-year-old. A former England schoolboy and then England youth player, he's always been tipped for the top. He made his league debut in March 1987 when Martin Hodges' long consecutive run came to an end. Born in Ballymena, Nigel Worthington joined Wednesday from Notts County in February 1984 for £125,000 and played an important part in the promotion success. He's approaching 250 appearances for the Owls. Defender Phil King began his career at Exeter. He came to Hillsborough in November 89 for £400,000 from Swindon and missed only two games last season. He's an adventurous fullback, never afraid to add width to the Wednesday attack. Midfield general John Sheridan made over 250 appearances for Leeds United, one for Nottingham Forest, before joining Wednesday for half a million pounds in November 89. His form at Hillsborough took him to the World Cup finals as a member of Jack Charlton's squad. Daly and Atkinson is now missing from the lineup. No manager likes to see the back of his sort of talent, so perhaps there really is such a thing as an offer you can't refuse. There was no bigger fan of Daly than myself. I thought Daly was and, and possibly could still be one of the great players in the world. I think he's got that much potential. And um, the Spanish team, had, they, they kept making inquiries, making inquiries. They started at a million pounds and so forth, and I kept refusing and refusing. Until the end, it went up to one and three-quarter million, which is big money. Now, the only proviso I made on that was I would do that deal if I could get my replacements in. Now, the, the people we had earmarked, we were fortunate enough to get. Um, sometimes you have a, a short list of players, and you don't always get the one you want, and you have to go f take, make contingency plans and go for, say, second or third choice. In our case, Paul Williams genuinely topped the list of strikers. Young, the type of striker I like to sign, young, he's got a goals record, he's scored goals in the first division, and ambitious. Um, so consequently, we, we were fortunate enough to get him. We felt we needed a right-sided player for some time now. Um, basically, ever since we, we failed to get Strachan when he went to Leeds. So, Danny Wilson, um, Richie knew in particular, well, and Richie had Richie been on about him all summer. He, he said, you know, if we get Danny Wilson on our side, we will have a... A, a hell of a strength in midfield. And uh, we, were, we were fortunate because Luton apparently had some financial problems. We were fortunate enough to maybe nick him. I mean, a lot of people think it's uh, a very cheap price. It is, I might point out, the most I've ever paid for a 30-year-old. I've never paid that sort of price before, but all in all, we, we, you know, we'd outlaid something like 800,000 pounds and got one and three quarter million pounds in. We're, and whilst we hadn't got anyone quite as exciting as Dalian, we had, in my opinion, got a stronger all-round squad, which is, you know, at the end of the day, is what we're after. In football, I think you've always got uh, uh, you've got goals, you've got long-term goals, you've got uh, um, short-term, and the short-term is always the next match. Uh, the medium-term is, is is probably ten games away, and the long-term in football invariably is next season. And uh, and so we're always looking short term is is, is the, the next game and the long term is is building for the future but not too distant future because many people are built for the future and have never seen that. Um, no, we're looking we're looking short term future and we would hope that uh, we have a good season this year and uh, hopefully in the first division next year and competing for all the major trophies with the big clubs. <laughs>
excellent bunch of players, um, probably as good as any that, that, that I've ever worked with um, in terms of attitude. Their attitude invariably is first class. I mean, you know, very, very few days do you, do you think, well, I don't want to train with them today because they won't be at it or they won't be motivated. And at the moment, it's, uh, it, it's a pleasure and a privilege to work with them. What about the men in the famous blue and white stripes week in, week out, the players themselves? What are their thoughts and their hopes? We perform very well, especially away from home, uh, where we get time and space a little bit more than we do at home because teams tend to get everybody behind the ball. Make it frustrating for us, but we keep plugging away. We've had the results that count. Yeah. We've been playing well at home, but not picking up three points, which is uh, a bit disappointing seeing the, the number of supporters that have turned out to see us play. Um, I think the West Ham game, the first half of the West Ham game was sort of the best we've performed this season. It was a, just a joy to play in. But um, we're playing well and it's a good start to the season. When Ron Sammy from Forest, he, uh, he gave me the chance of playing first two football. So um, really, it was all down to him and me staying. So, uh, but I was, I was very happy at the club. I mean, um, big disappointment getting relegated, but um, I was still happy at the club. And, um, Hopefully we can uh, get back in the first division at first attempt. I think it's absolutely superb football. Like, you know, it's very enjoyable to play in the, the side at the moment. Uh, everybody's full of confidence. You know, so it's. Uh, I think the fans are enjoying it as well. Like, you know, it's they appreciate. Um, although we may not be scoring and winning every week, although we have had a good start, but we have had a few draws. But the, from the entertaining side of it, you know, the, the crowd are absolutely loving it. Yeah, so it's from our point of view, we can't ask any more of it. I think everyone here wants to play in the first division. Um, you know, we've got a first division squad here, and the first division is the place to, to be. You know, when uh, someone like myself is playing the first division, you know, virtually his career, you want to get back as soon as possible. The support's been uh, absolutely fantastic, and uh, you know, to get 30,000 against Newcastle and 28,000 against uh, West Ham, it's a marvellous achievement. Because uh, if you remember, you know, I have played for big clubs, but my last club was Queens Park Rangers, and uh, when we used to get 10,000, we used to consider that was a good gate. I've got to do the, the proper thing on the pitch and get on with the business of playing football, that's what it's all about. And uh, hopefully, as I say, get back in the first division where we belong. The supporters here are second to none. The support them was tremendous and uh, they're proven to be that way this year again. And that is, uh, at the end of the day, a tremendous help to the players to give them that lift. Playing for Sheffield Wednesday and scoring in front of 70 fans is uh, probably every striker's dream, really. When you see the ball hit the back of the net and everyone's happy and rejoicing for you, then it's a good feeling. I strongly believe that Sheffield Wednesday have a great chance of promotion. Um, I think they're probably the best side in Division 2. That was one of the reasons why I came to the club, and I've got no reason to doubt why we shouldn't go up to Division 1 next season. They're doing well. I mean, as a, as a unit, um, Danny Wilson's coming, which has made us more compact, and Nigel Worthington's uh, on the left, and we're, we're working well up and down together. And uh, we're trying to create space for John Sheridan on the ball, and it seems to be working at the moment. This season, we're doing exceptionally well. Uh, things are going right for us, say, which last season didn't happen. Uh, the lads have got a lot of confidence. The ball, you know, we're knocking the ball around very well. Uh, and, and I think, you know, we're doing excellent. I think it's very important for the club and for the people of Sheffield in Hull. You know, they're, uh, I think it's very important that we get promotion, especially the first time. I think we're playing very well. Um, we seem to be struggling a bit at home to get the results. Um, it seems mainly down to teams wanting to, to defend. And uh, we seem to have a bit of trouble breaking them down. And uh, with an expectant large crowd, we seem to have uh, a bit of trouble, you know, especially second half, where uh, teams that do hang on and seem only to be one down uh, are getting a bit of confidence from that and uh, snatching a late draw, you know. So apart from that, we're playing superb football and um, getting some great results away from home. Oh, I think we're, we're playing uh, some first division football because uh, I think we're, we're 
one of those teams who really play football the way it should be should be done, and uh, that's great. Obviously, the main aim uh, of Sheffield Wednesday is uh, to go all out guns blazing for, for promotion, uh, get back in the first division. That is the, the main target. So uh, that is what everybody at the club is driving for. We'd like to go up definitely, and uh, champions would really be a bonus, but we will definitely be going for championship. Definitely. The will to win definitely begins right here with the fans. The players, the management, in fact the whole club acknowledge the debt they owe to their remarkable supporters. Wednesdayites have a passion and a loyalty for their team that amazes outsiders. The faithful support is impressive when things aren't going well for the club. When the football's flowing and the goals are coming, when Wednesday are on the march, the supporters are nothing less than inspirational. They've played a very big part so far because vocally, um, you know, they've been behind us very much, at, at both at home and away. And, you know, they've given us a vote of confidence by turning out uh, the open day in big numbers. So I think we've really got their support at the moment. Uh, and there's a buzz around the city. They're all very expectant. And uh, so, so far, we've, uh, I think, lived up to their expectations. We know if we produce the goods, the people will come in. Now, there's a lot of, lot of people, in, a lot of clubs in the game can't, can't really boast that. You know, you take Oldham and people like that um, that can produce excellent stuff, but no, they're, not, they're going to get a limited crowd appeal. We know that there's no end to what could happen here. You know, I just sometimes sit back and imagine what would, what would be like if we, if we could pull a European night here. I mean, just think if we were playing AC or Inter Milan here tomorrow, something like that, you know, you're looking at, well, you have to play two matches. You know, there'd be that many of the crowds, the crowds would be queuing up around the practice ground as well. A lot of people will boast that they have the best fans in the, in the country. I don't think there's any better than that. Um, because they, they've stuck with us through, they have stuck with us through thick and thin, obviously. I mean, I couldn't believe when I was in Italy for the World Cup. We've just got relegated. And I'm getting reports that I like our season tickets, for argument's sake, are 20% up on last season. And I think that's... That transmits it through to the players. The players know that. They knew when, when they came here and there was an open day and there's 22,000 people here on an open day. You know, they know that uh, the people of Sheffield, or half, or more than half the people of Sheffield are willing them on. This season, Wednesday are playing the sort of football the fans want to see. Even the supporters of their opponents are joining in the applause. It must be hard seeing your own team played off the park, but at least they're getting the consolation of seeing sparkling soccer. Wednesday against Plymouth. This was the game that's now known as Trevor Francis's match. But when you can still orchestrate a game like this, who's counting?
If the visiting fans enjoyed the performance, and many had the good grace to admit they did, the home fans loved it. After all, it's another step in the right direction. And for Ron Atkinson, that direction is up. I know if we're fortunate, or if we manage to get back up this season, I don't want to go back down again. You know, I hate it's the worst experience I've ever had in the game. And I think, and I hope, that that comes through to some of the some of the players, particularly, shall we say, the younger ones that are making their career. I mean, they should look at that and say, hey, we started off last season a first division player, we finished up second division players. You know, and the place to be in is the first division. I mean, one or two other people say that relegation was a blessing in disguise. I don't see it that way at all. I think if I'd have had the team, this team could have gone in the first division now and give a very, very good account of itself. I think Ron Atkinson's one of the best professionals in the game. He's dedicated to football. He's dedicated to the way he wants to play it. And Ron is his own man. And I think, given the opportunity, he can make Sheffield Wednesday better than Manchester United ever was. I think he's the man for the job. There's still 20 minutes left of Saturday morning, but over the next few hours, the transformation will be quite remarkable. There's a magic about match day, the mood of a home fixture at Hillsborough, that's difficult to express in words. It needs sensing, savouring. It's hard to imagine that in three hours, the atmosphere will be highly charged, with 25,000 packed into this stadium, waiting for the whistle. It's not hard to imagine why. Today's match against Oldham Athletic has special significance. It's been billed as vital to both clubs. To many, and certainly the committed supporters, it's the match to find the top team in the division. For those who arrive at the ground early, the bonus of getting that cherished autograph, the chance to chat to men you'll soon be cheering. After three, you'll just be part of the roar. In the dressing room, players are doing their best to relax, or at any rate, control the growing tension. There are autograph books to sign. A bit of light reading, perhaps a profile on the man you'll be marking can help. Players have their peculiarities. On the terrace, it's much the same. Up to 12,000 match programmes are sold at home games. The only printed matter more important is the precious match ticket. As kickoff approaches and the crowds start to swell, the man in charge of safety, the club's liaison with South Yorkshire Police, Doug Locke, takes control. I'm the Chief Steward here at Sheffield Wednesday, and we have uh, the ground. It's segregated into five areas. We have senior stewards in the ground in all of the areas, and then we have around about 200 stewards working every match day. And to help us conform to the Safety Sports Ground Act, especially after Taylor, we have to monitor every 95 entry gates and all areas of the ground, and we do this with the police. And we have here, as you can see, videos on every one of the gates, so that if you look, for instance, on this particular gate, which is at Leppings Lane End, we can see the away fans coming because that's exclusively for the away fans. In addition to that, as they come through the turnstiles, we have a computer here, and this shows our entry through every single gate, and then it shows our total area, and then the whole ground area. If we can see that we are within 10% of capacity, and also that there are lots of people there, then we will go to the police, and we will go to our stewards, and we will ask them to start to move people around to other parts of the ground because we can see on our computer where we have capacity. Consequently, when, you, when any of, the, of our fans find out they have to be moved because we're closing down gates, we're giving them some warning so that they can be moved to other parts of the ground and admitted before the game starts. Now, if we get a very difficult problem, the police always reserve the right to postpone the kickoff of the match for 15 minutes. South stand covered 6-3-1, uncovered 9-0-5, it's a highly sophisticated system that ensures a high degree of control and surveillance, which in turn has meant there's little or no violence on the terraces. That is bringing back the family groups and the youngsters. 
The young owls are an important part of the club and its future. They don't only watch and cheer and learn. They're coached and they play in special age group squads. Those too young for even that are just as welcome, especially if they can bring Dad along with them. The young owls and the not-so-young owls are on the move. There are very few clubs, if any, that can drop from the first to the second division and maintain, if not improve, their gates. The rest of the football world may be staggered by the loyalty of the Wednesdayites, but the dedicated backroom office staff aren't. On match days, they're always far too busy to give it much thought anyway. Win, lose or draw, they'll be back. In fact, due to demand, advance bookings are being taken for up to five weeks ahead. Wednesday have dropped from Division 1 five times since 1950. On three occasions, they bounced straight back as champions. You can almost taste the growing conviction that it could be happening again. Determination and commitment written across every face. John Sheridan doesn't need anyone to tell him this is a vital match. Ron Atkinson doesn't need reminding either. Ron, on paper, it's the second division's match of the season. Yes, certainly at this stage of the year it is. Um, great day. Uh, there'll be a, a massive crowd here. Perfect playing conditions, yeah. Should be a smashing game. Oldham in their distinctive all-red strip, getting the match away. And quite extraordinary to think that Sheffield Wednesday's first league defeat of the season last week at Millwall dropped them to third place, six points behind the leaders, Oldham. West Ham, of course, sandwiched between the two of them at the top. Carlton Palmer, who scored his first goal of the season at Barnsley recently, and it was a point saver, that one. And no doubt about it that Wednesday recently haven't quite matched their early season form. Holden swings the crossover. The ball actually went out of play, though. 
One of them here is Worthington. King. Useful ball to Hurst, who turns his man nicely and gets the free kick. Well, an advantage might have been played there because he'd got away from the defender once the referee had decided it was to Wednesday's advantage. Well taken by Sheridan. Here's King and Shawley. Well, it's got off and David Hurst misses from there and he will be kicking himself. That's the best chance we've had in this opening quarter. Yes, it was a great ball. It was a great ball that was laid up the wall. Caught the old one asleep there, and I think he was a bit surprised that they got there so clear and so early. It's come down to Worthington. Chance to cross it in. Oh, it's right across, and this time he's hit the post. And David Hurst somehow cannot manoeuvre the ball between the posts, and he must wonder why. I can't believe it was a great cross here from the, from the boy, and he, he got clearly, went straight across. And Ritchie just turns it back inside Redfern, and Redfern was uh, spread it wide right now for Warhurst. He gallops on past King, Paul Warhurst, cuts it back, Pressman can't get there, and Oldham have the lead. Nick Henry popping up inside the penalty area. And Sheffield Wednesday, having spurned two good chances to go ahead themselves, now go one down. Well, that was a great run. It was a great run by Warhurst at the right back. He, he gave, gave the boy King across, and the boys got into the box very early. It's ironical to think that they've only had two chances, two attacks down there, and the ball came across. But I think the great thing was that the players got in the box so early. It was a great finish. Kerry, he's into the space, Pressman not sure, and Kerry's round him, it's two! David Kerry scores for Oldham, Wednesday were totally stretched, and David Kerry, who is skillful and used to score his goals for Barnsley, not far away, gets a priceless one for Oldham to take them two ahead. And I think the great thing there was, that they got caught very flat at the back, and uh, the ball over the top, and the, it was a great, great ball delivered in, and it was a great run by Kerry. And as you see here, he comes into the thing. I thought the goalkeeper was a little bit hesitant and came rather late. Had he, had he shifted himself a little bit earlier, he might have got there. So Wednesday really have it all to do now. And here at the back post, maybe, Carlton Palmer! It really isn't their day at the moment, and Sheridan can't beat him either. First has hit the post, Palmer's hit the bar. And Wednesday could have had three themselves, but they're two down. Picked up by Sheridan. He's the man they're looking to. What a lovely ball. He's played Hurst in here, and it just skidded on the turf. And uh, nothing against Hurst for that one, because it was the pace of the ball off the turf that caught him. It just fell at an awkward height for David Hurst. Here's a goal, maybe. Off the post, surely now. Shirtley couldn't finish it either, and somehow that Oldham goal seems to have a charmed life today. Danny Wilson to hoist it back in. Over the top from Hurst. And how on earth Oldham haven't conceded one, two, three, or even four goals is almost beyond belief. Hurst holding off balance. Sheridan this time, it's intercepted by Holden. And makes tracks in the opposite direction. And Sheridan gets another chance to find Hart. Lovely ball into Williams. And Paul Williams! It's six inches outside the upright. And that really does sum up Wednesday's luck yet again in the game. Yeah, that was a great move. That was a good... That, that's Wednesday at its best. They played the ball early, they knocked it early. John Sheridan knocked the ball wide well. Great little chip in by the American boy from the right back. A great chance there. And Wednesday deserves some reward, surely. Sheridan goes on. Did get a bounce there. Here's a great chance. David Hurst trying to round it off. That's a penalty. Wednesday do get their chance now. And Oldham do not object. And David Hurst going on into the penalty area. It was a lovely ball through to him. And he's earned the penalty. He's got to finish it off. It's great here. John Sheridan does very well here. He plays, plays the ball in. David Hurst does well. First time David's really got into the pot, got the bit between his teeth and attacked him. And he's brought him down. Definite penalty. Hurst has handed the job over to Sheridan, who's taking an almighty long run-up. John Sheridan to bring Sheffield Wednesday back into it. 
perfectly tucked away. It's 2-1 now, and what a game we've got on our hands. And Worthington on the halfway line raises his arm to the crowd and says, come on, lift us. Yeah, it's certainly going to be a great match now. I think this is the, this is the incentive that uh, Wednesday needed. Now they've got a great chance. Great penalty by John Sheridan. Worthington down the line, Francis. And oh, the crowd held their breath then as Trevor slipped. He gained his feet. Now gets the ball over. Hurst in there. Oh, what a marvellous save. He's not gone away yet. Scramble off the line. Save his side. Yeah, that was an excellent, excellent cross as the ball comes in here. David Hurst gets a brilliant header. Reminds me of the old Gordon Banks. It's nearly one of those saves. Brilliant save by the goalkeeper. There's been a sort of FA Cup atmosphere about this one. And it's still not all over us. Wilson pings another crossover. Back post for Carlton Palmer. Mike Ball for Sheridan. John Sheridan goes on and on. And is this another penalty? It is. And Sheridan wins a penalty. Pure skill got him into the position. He took it on and on. And eventually there was nothing left to do but to bring him down. And again, credit referee Ron Groves with being right on the spot. Yeah, it was a great cross of ball to Carlton Palmer here. John takes the initiative here, which he, which he's very good at, and this is the situation for him. He gets in that box, he's got the ability to go by people. And Sheridan himself has the chance to cap it with his second goal, and the equaliser is 2-2! And That's Wednesday have come right back into it. And you can tell from the expression on Sheridan's face how much it means to him and the club. He got two against Plymouth a few weeks ago, but he won't get a more important goal than this one now. And Ron Atkinson is off his feet, he's on his feet, Alan Smith is there. And Wednesday are backing it with this Sheridan penalty. Yes. Touched away beautifully. Yeah, it's a great penalty by John, that. But I think there's no doubt, Morris, these two sides have got to be in the shake-up to go up to Division 1 at the end of the season. Well, it looks very much that way, John. I, I mean, I was at the Nottingham Forest uh, Spurs game last week, and it was, and I tell you what, this is on par, if not a little bit better and more exciting. Here's Hurst, the chance to win it is Wednesdays, they can't take it. It looked very much like he was offside there, but I think that's what they all thought. Well, I thought Danny Wilson was offside, and uh, I haven't seen a whistle or a flag or anything. But it was a great chance, a great ball in, he heads it down well. But no, I don't think he was. It was, it was an excellent chance. That could have clinched it for him. Oh, that would have been a dramatic finale. As it is, the referee blows for full time to signal the end of surely one of the best matches anybody could ever wish to see here. It's ended Sheffield Wednesday 2, Oldham 2. Tremendous test of character for both sides. Oldham 2 up early on through Nick Henry and David Kerry. Wednesday coming back, giving their all with John Sheridan there, converting two second-half penalties. 1-1 one, one by Hurst, 1-1 one, one by himself and perhaps the result is absolutely perfect from two teams who we all think will probably be in Division 1 next season. Sheffield Wednesday 2, Oldham 2. For these two in particular, it's been a tension-filled afternoon. Ron Atkinson and Richie Barker are seasoned professionals who know the game inside out. With their players and the rest of the staff, they know it's only one afternoon in many in the attempt to turn the dream into reality for the people who pay their wages, the supporters of Sheffield Wednesday Football Club. If there's one thing that bonds them all together, fans, players, the management and the board, it's the will to win. Wednesday supporters have been absolutely brilliant to this club. I think they must be the best in the land. Not for just the support, for the way they've tracked the club, for their intelligence. I mean, we took the fences down and not one of them has been on the pitch. Not one single person. They come here, we had an open day, 21,000 through the door. We never expected that. We failed in, in a, a nice sort of way that we started at half past nine and had to close the doors at three o'clock. But from Wednesday's point of view, we admire the way they've supported this club. We will try and give them that bite.
by putting good football and good management at this club and hope that we win something this year for them.